Hi everyone, Claptony Back Tano here, the internet's busiest music nerd, and it's time for another edition of List, List Week, Week. Uh, 2020, where I'm giving you guys my highlights of the year, the good, the bad, and uh, the very bad, with my worst songs. Ugh. This, year this year is, is driving, driving me crazy. crazy. The worst albums of 2020. You know, this pandemic year was really crappy for a lot of reasons, especially in in the musical realm, uh, one of which was the slowing down or the pushing back of major releases, of potentially good releases, but for whatever reason, uh, all of this didn't uh, really slow down the, the release of bad music. It seemed like there was uh, just as much bad music as there usually is. <laughs> And yeah, here are 10 examples of that in this top 10 list. Starting at number 10, it's uh, Machine Gun Kelly, Tickets to My Downfall, a number one record uh, in the country, miraculously, one that I guess a lot of people like and care for, and uh, it seems many out there have uh, commended Machine Gun Kelly on his transition into pop punk, but if this is pop punk, it is the most derivative, lowest common denominator, and uh, I guess faux rebellious pop punk I have heard in my life. Ugh. Plus on top of that, a lot of the production and compression on this thing is god awful. The way the occasional trap beat works its way into the background as well is utterly gross. Vocals are painfully mediocre. Songwriting could use a tune up here and there, and not that I'm the type of person to check people on their age regularly, but uh, this guy just turned 30 and he's writing songs as if, like, he's an angsty 19 year old and it's just not the best look. <laughs> To suddenly go into that when you've just, like, flipped the big 3-0, oh, it's, it's kind of a weird time. It's an odd time. But it's an odd year, so whatever. Next on this list at number 9 is Justin Bieber with Changes. Um, this album, in a word, bland. Without a doubt, this is the most pointless and flavorless project that Justin has ever put out, and the man is convinced this is an R&B album? Yeah, I don't really know. There's not much I can compliment this album on, truly and honestly. I mean, maybe it's not uh, the most hideous thing I've ever heard just on its face, but uh, looking at the songwriting and looking at the production, looking at the vocal performances, it's so devoid of anything that could be regarded as entertaining or as uh, memorable or as bold that the record almost becomes just like a void. A creative void that as I'm staring into it, I just wonder how deep can it go? How hollow and how free of anything truly, I guess, substantive can this record be? And the deeper I go into that abyss, the more I fear for my life, the more that uh, uh, it, it seems like nothing around me matters and existence is pointless. Next, at number eight, we have two projects that left a bit more of an impression on me, and that is Nav's Good Intentions and Brown Boy 2. Uh, Nav is back, Canadian singer, rapper, producer. Uh, not only did he come through with uh, yet another helping of his uh, very robotic, stiff, soulless, and uh, by-the-numbers trap anthems, but uh, he gave us a, a, a second dose. He gave us a second dose with Brown Boy 2. Uh, two projects that sonically, stylistically, and lyrically are just so not distinct from each other at all that you could just literally trade tracks from one, put them on the other, it doesn't even matter. Nav obviously trying to copy and profit off of that little Uzi Vert model from earlier this year, where you're kind of just like putting out one more album entirely, but you're naming it like the deluxe version of the original record, so that original record does even more numbers. Yeah, it's a cute little racket that you have going on there with this, but Nav couldn't even wait an entire week to put the 
other version of the record out. And uh, again, when you heard the entire thing, like it, it was just like one continual slog of Nab's music continually, especially this new project, is about the closest modern hip hop gets to literally just being ambient music. I think hip hop that actually tries to consciously take an ambient direction leaves more of an impact and an impression than this does, because this is just so repetitive and it's just so predictable that you can't really pay attention to it in the foreground of your mind for too long because it literally gives you nothing to pay attention to. Like, what exactly about any of this would draw your mind to it? Again, it's not the beats, it's not the vocals, it's not the lyrics, and it's certainly not the songwriting. Next at number seven is g Easy with Everything Strange. Uh, yes, Gerald came through with his sad little indie kind of uh, singer-songwriter rock-ish maybe record. Uh, you know, Machine Gun Kelly and many other rappers are not the only ones out there going a little rock these days. But yeah, this was just like a very sad and I, I think um, pathetic, you know, display of, of uh, oh, I'm uh, broken up, I, you, you, you miss me, I miss you, oh, this relationship's so bad. Ah! But yeah, production on this thing sucks, vocals on this thing sucks, the songwriting sucks, but everything you really need to know about this record, I think, is displayed by the opening track, which is a cover of the song Everybody's Gotta Learn Sometime, and g Easy's version sounds eerily alike uh, to the Beck version of that song, which, if many of you remember, is a part of the Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind soundtrack, where the protagonist is in love with a girl with colorful hair who's a little erratic, and so on and so forth. It's a great movie, by the way. Uh, how much you want to bet that Gerald went through his breakup and helped things along? He's crying on the couch eating popcorn, watching Jim Carrey, just like, oh, I gotta, I gotta bring all my memories back home. Oh. So yeah, the record is sad, it's bitter, and it's lacking in all the ways that you just really don't want to be. Uh, I wonder if at some point will Gerald like try to delete this album from the internet because it's it's not a cute look. It it is not a cute look. Next at number six comes a band that I just learned about recently. It's uh, the Psychosexual record, <laughs> Torch the Faith. Yeah, this band already landed on my worst songs of the year list with Let the Sin Begin, and lo and behold, the rest of the record is uh, shitty too. And pretty much for all the reasons that that song is awful. I mean, granted, the rest of the album doesn't seem as sort of like perverted throughout. You know, it doesn't all sort of boil down to you know, the devil daddy spankings and the devil daddy come and all that stuff. Uh, but Lord, if this record isn't some of the most awfully recorded and engineered industrial rock with just bad cartoony devil vocals. Like, who is honestly looking at the devil daddy right now and is like, oh yeah, that's cool. Like, he doesn't even look the least bit threatening or menacing or anything like that. He, he looks like, I don't know, like a Beetlejuice character or something like that. Or, or what is that one Adult Swim show? The devil in that show is more menacing than this devil. It's just so cringe for track after track after track. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm just a... Uh, just not into the devil daddy. I'm just not I'm just not down with the devil daddy. Next at number five, we have a total shit fit of pop and country and rock and hip hop and R&B coming all together on this abortion of an album. Uh, that is Sam Hunt with Southside. Yeah, this shit's horrendous. Like it's actually difficult to listen to some of the production on this thing, the way the R&B and hip hop production and the snap beats tie in with the country and rock instruments instrumentation, plus the vocals are pretty crap for much of the LP too. Then on top of that, it's the gross-ass songwriting, some of which is, I guess, a little patronizing and sexist at points. Uh, there are other throwaway lines that are quite odd where Sam is going on about, you know, weird stuff going on in like the wheat fields, which, you know, makes me kind of want to swear off bread. Plus the whole project seems to reach a really odd apex where, uh, you know, all these songs are about breaking up with this one single person, and then it sort of seems like he spends the back end of the record putting that person on blast for what reason I don't know, and I don't know, it kind of makes me just like
like worry about uh, this individual's well-being where Sam gets off being this much of a dick uh, on a very public platform to somebody who, for all intents and purposes at this point, is like a private person. Uh, I don't know, but yeah, he kind of did that and he looks like a total asshole doing it. So yeah, in many ways think of it as like the G-Easy project, but with even worse genre fusions and crossovers going on. And on top of all of that, the breakup that it's all obsessed with uh, has another person involved in it that has like little to no platform to even defend themselves from or call you out on your bullshit from. Sam Hunt Southside, this record is trash and he seems kind of like a jerk. Number four on our list is Danzig, and uh, that's a Danzig Sings Elvis. Now, uh, this album is certainly a Danzig album, uh, but whether or not any real singing goes on here is up for debate, and uh, some of the reinterpretations here are so terrible and off base. I mean, they may not even be Elvis songs at this point, so, you know, one of my biggest critiques of this project is false advertising, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, th this thing is really uh, indicative of how much Glenn Danzig has fallen off over the years. This is a rough listen. These covers are quite awful, not just vocally, but instrumentally. Like, fucking lord, this record was recorded on the cheap. Like, this is some real demo shit in terms of the way the instrumentals sound. Like, the mixes are crap, the uh, way the instrumentation is played is very minimal and very wonky. I gotta say, this is easily one of the most just messily and shoddily assembled covers projects I think I've ever heard. I, I don't think I've heard too many more projects other than this that uh, do more injustice to the original material than this one. And uh, I, I guess also doing an injustice to the legacy of Glenn Danzig as well, who I think is uh, one of the best, or you know, has proven himself at least at one point to be one of the best vocalists in punk and just rock music in general uh, with uh, Miss Fits and his solo stuff, but but yeah, this uh, was not good. This was not good at all. Even less good than that, in my opinion, at number three, we have a Green Day with Father of All. I think I can say hands down this is the worst Green Day album ever. Uh, even, like, worse than the Uno Dos Trace shit? Yeah, I really do feel that way about this record. It seems like the band has really lost touch with the rebellious punk spirit that put them on the map to begin with, even if that did come in a pop-punk form early on in their career. Because on this one, they essentially, like, transition into writing and recording a bunch of, like, low-grade sports arena rock where I can just imagine a bunch of beer belly fucks just pounding their fists and lighters into the air wearing beer hats and sports team t-shirts. And like, what is the hope here? That these songs are gonna get jammed at baseball games or some shit? I really have no idea. What is the end game here? What is the purpose of all of this stuff? I mean, the band promoted it in a really awkward way, saying like, this is pure uncut rock, no Swedish songwriters, Oh, Well like, what was your previous stuff? Weren't your other previous albums like rock? Weren't they uncut? Weren't they not Swedish songwriter-less? Uh, what are you achieving here that you didn't already on your previous shit? While I haven't really been a big fan of much of what Green Day has done since they, you know, kind of transitioned post the American Idiot era, uh, I can at least say, like, the vast majority of what they've done since then has been way better than this, and all I can do is hope and pray that they at least bounce back a little bit into something that uh, sounds a little more gutsy and a little less like I'm paying 12 fucking dollars for a beer. Next on this list at number two, Total Legends of Alternative Metal and Rock, Trapped with Shadow Work. Yeah, this album is Poo Poo, it's Pee Pee, it's Doo Doo, and it's uh, Wee Wee. Uh, and on top of that, uh, this is like one of the most insecure shows of masculinity I think I've heard in 2020. And what's funny is like, despite that, the record doesn't even go that hard. It's just like grossly generic and commercial metal music meant for the radio and the radio market that, it, that it's trying to appeal to doesn't even exist anymore. If I could like categorize Trapped in any way, shape or form, I would say Trapped, Weird, fucking, creepy, fucking, 
dudes. And also weird and creepy is the album at our number one spot, and that would be uh, Tory Lanez with Daystar. Lord, was this record shit in pretty much every way that a record could be shit from front to back. Like, stylistically derivative and bland. So many tracks on this thing where he doesn't even sound like himself because he's just ripping off The Weeknd. He's just ripping off Drake again. He's just ripping off any other contemporary he thinks he can get, like, a hit sound off of. And then on top of that, the songwriting and lyricism is annoying and dumb as fuck because the entire thing is centered, obviously, around the whole to-do with Megan the Stallion and the shooting and the accusations and so on and so forth. And it's odd that he does an entire album about this because at multiple points on the record, he doesn't go into the detail of anything and then claims that like, oh yeah, I can't go into the detail of this because I got a case and it's still out. And yet after the release of this album, he ended up going into the details or what they were allegedly on social media anyway. But yeah, the, the performances are not appealing here. Again, super derivative style, generic and forgettable production much of the time. And lyrically, I don't know why you would listen to this unless you either wanted to be, like, gaslit. You were volunteering to be gaslit for, like, an hour's worth of time. Or I guess if you wanted to, like, psychoanalyze somebody who's, like, clearly not telling the truth. At the end of the day, um, I don't know what happened between Megan and Tori. They're accusations. I mean, I do happen to believe Megan, and I feel like Megan's side of things feels a bit more valid than Tori essentially going, I mean, at the end of the day, I don't claim to know and understand the truth of the situation, and, uh, and I may never fully know or understand the truth of the situation. I'm just saying which side, from my point of view seems a little bit more legitimate at this point, and I feel like this record that is just packed full of, of uh, like, omission after omission after omission and just red herring after red herring after red herring. You'd have to be a dumbass not to see it. Yeah, this record packed full of that uh, could really, I guess, be used as a, uh, a case study, I, I suppose, for this kind of thing. And uh, yeah, because of that and a host of other things uh, where it falls short on, it's a uh, trash. And in my opinion, uh, the most steaming pile of garbage that I've heard this year. So thankless and so unlikable and so difficult to separate from the BS that it's about, you can't even really truthfully review it because, like, even if it was good musically, you couldn't even enjoy it, at least from, like, a moral standpoint, in my opinion. You can't even really appreciate it uh, beyond its uh, horrid and uh, terrible attempts at, again, gaslighting the audience because uh, those are just so egregious and terrible. Again, you couldn't really appreciate it for anything else. <sighs> so, yeah, let me know down in the comments what were uh, the most garbage records of the year to you, and I will see you in the next one. You're the best, and I love you. Anthony Fantano, Transition. Have you given these albums a listen? Did you love them? Did you hate them? What would you rate them? You're the best. You're the best. What should I review next? Hit the like if you like. Please subscribe and please don't cry. Hit the bell as well. Over here next to my head is another video that you could check out. Hit that up or the link to subscribe to the channel. Anthony Fantano, Worst Albums 2020 Forever.